Hello, I'm Ray Gerard. Welcome to SJEN TV, another uh, segment in our series on Saul David Alinsky, his thoughts, his writings, and their effect on our society today. And for our program today, we have with us an author, Professor Ronald Richlack from the University of Mississippi, who wrote a book called Disinformation, along with General how do you pronounce his name? Ian Mahai Pachepa. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Um, Two tough names there. <laughs> <laughs> and tell us who he is. Sure. Well, General Pachepa was the number two man in Romania to, uh, under Ceausescu. He was the head of foreign intelligence. So uh, he was a Cold War spy. And in a very dramatic break, he defected to the United States. He's the highest ranking defector from behind the Soviet bloc. He came over, spent three years in debriefing with the CIA, revealed all kinds of information, got, received a letter from the CIA thanking him for making the most significant contribution that's ever been made to our foreign intelligence agencies in terms of breaking down uh, opposing foreign intelligence, um, caused uh, 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 Ceausescu to have a nervous breakdown, <laughs> put $2 million on his head, dispatch some assassination teams, including Carlos the Jackal, to come over to kill him, but has survived, lives even today in the United States under a new identity. So he, uh, he rankled a few feathers back home. <laughs> he, he, ca he caused quite an, uh, an upset, an upstir. So the title of your book is Disinformation. Why the title? What does that mean? Well, that's one of the, the important revelations that General Pachepa made when he came over. Now, when you and I think about spies, we're usually thinking about stealing information and getting stuff and, and people trying to figure out what we're doing. He pointed out that the far more important thing that the Soviets were engaged in was putting forth false stories, putting false stories that caused Americans to question our government, question our leadership, question our history, question our institutions, question our churches, for instance. Uh, and, and it was really trying to build that false narrative, that doubt, that questioning inside the, the heads of Americans. It was how they were waging the Cold War. So instead of, as you say, spies, coming up with secret information that the other side already has, they're planting fake stories. Exactly, fake exactly. Stories. And, and it, it's, it's a fascinating process. And they were very good at it, very adept at it. They had quite a developed process. There were more people involved in, in intelligence gathering or d dispersing fake news uh, than really were involved in the military. I think your book says something about, was it like a million people just involved in the intelligence services themselves, uh, in addition to, you know, I guess, millions more in these, you know, what, you know, affiliated organizations of one sense or another. Right, and on top of that, you put in what, what they referred to as useful idiots, the, the, the people who bought into their stories and really, not knowing, became agents of disinformation for the Soviet bloc. Now, how about some, do we have any examples of maybe some large, you know, stories involving fake news or disinformation that affected us here in the U.S.? I mean, I think there's a couple in your book. One was, I think, uh, what is it, 2003, the museum in Baghdad? Museum in Baghdad, that's a, a somewhat more recent one. So the war in Iraq, the, the uh, curator of the museum in Baghdad is on television in tears talking about how Americans have destroyed, I think, 1,700 pieces of antiquity. I can actually help you with that number. Oh, if, hey, if you got it exactly, <laughs> tell me. Because <laughs> your book actually mentioned something about 170,000. I, I knew there was a 17 in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 170. I, I, I knew, that. I'll, just tons of, of, but the thing was, that was disinformation. The guy's on TV, he's crying, he's talking about the, the, how horrible the Americans were in doing this. Well, when the wars ended, it turns out that before the Americans even got there, the museum people hid away all of the pieces, all of the art. When after the war, everything was gathered, they missed 20, 25 pieces disappeared somewhere. But there was 25 out of <laughs> 25 out of, out of, out of number. Yeah. yeah. So it w there was not the uh, not the devastation that that really and, and all that was about was getting trying to get Americans to question the legitimacy of our armed forces. 
But another big one, I guess, was, uh, and this one was planted, I think, by some communist, uh, I think your book says, it was planted by some communist sympathizers or communist organizations. Um, it was back in the 1990s. Uh, some churches down south. All right. The, the, the National Council of Churches was one of the groups uh, that came out and talked about the burning of black churches, about how there was a crisis and, and racists were burning black churches all across the south. President Bill Clinton spoke out and talked about how he remembered with pain in his childhood when he's in Arkansas and hearing about black churches burn, uh, you know, in, in, in Arkansas. Well, again, it turns out that this led to legislation. It led to the World Council of Churches, another communist front, uh, sending observers to the United States. It led to fed federal legislation, making it a federal crime to, to burn a church in this kind of scenario. Well, it turns out there were hardly any, in fact, actual black churches that were burned. There were none burned in Arkansas when Bill Clinton was a boy, unlike what he claimed to remember. Uh, it was all, again, a piece of, of fake news, false disinformation, causing us to really trying to divide the nation to say, hey, it's horrible racism that's going on here when it really wasn't. But when these things, when these things take place, people get very excited. They, people get very angry. There's, I mean, it, it unleashes a, a furor. I mean, these stories, they're completely false and they can have dramatic effects. Well, and, and you know, if they, should, if they were true, they should make you angry. You know, and, and another one was during um, uh, the Vietnam War, when supposedly our soldiers were, you know, just outrageously gunning down innocent civilians and wiping out villages. Occasionally there were bad things that happened, but, but, but it was nowhere near the, 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 in fact, this is one, it's fascinating to talk to Pacheco about this. Pacheco saw, when John Kerry came back and testified about how, like Genghis Khan, the, the American marauders were coming through and wiping out villages, Pachepa heard that and said, that's our story. That's what we've been putting out. I can't believe, and now John Kerry wasn't intentionally acting as an agent on behalf of the Soviets, but he bought into the story and he's spreading the story. And it's a lot more credible coming from him, a young soldier, than it would be if it was coming from a Soviet newspaper. People believed it, thought it was true. He, I'm sure he thought it was true. But it was disinformation that he had picked up and he was just respreading. So people sit around in some back offices in the Kremlin or in these offices at the Securitate in Romania. They come up with a story, they put it out there, then all of a sudden they hear other people repeating it goes around the world on the news. Amazing. Well, uh, you, you know, and, and if you think about it, what they would do is they'd find a little local newspaper or even, even a, a, a newsletter, a, a bulletin somewhere, get a story in there and get one in, in the trade union paper and get one over there. Pretty soon it's in four or five papers. The, the local newspaper picks up the story. It, it makes it in two or three local newspapers. Soon it's national news that they just built from the ground up that way. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Now, actually... Pope Francis really recently spoke about disinformation. Right. And uh, he was addressing uh, World Communication Day in January of last year, and he uh, put out a message and he said, we are witnessing the spread of what has come to be known as fake news. The term in general refers to the spreading of disinformation online or in traditional media. It has to do with false information based on non-existent or distorted data meant to deceive and manipulate. Spreading fake news can serve to advance specific goals, influence political decisions, etc. So he sees, it, it was funny to me when I came across this because talking about fake news in our media, and he uses the word disinformation. And that's exactly what their, their, what their, aim, what, what their aim was, to get disinformation out into news channels. Exactly, exactly the truth. And I think the Catholic Church has been the target of a great deal of disinformation. That's actually how this book came about, because uh, we, we looked at, at an intersection where uh, he had been the, part of the effort to frame Pope Pius XII as, a, as Hitler's pope, as a silent pope or whatever. And I'd done a lot of writing on that, and, and, and we found that out. And that was one of the stories he wanted to correct when he came here. Uh, but 
but uh, the the ability to misshape the news, misshape the stories, and today, you know, with social media, it just it's it's on steroids. It's very hard today to discern what's legitimate and what's fake. Yeah. Um, yeah, the book came up, you said your connection with him came about through, I guess, your work on Pius XII? Right. I mean, that was, now for decades now, there has been a story, there have been rumors, there have been uh, <laughs> suspicions that Pius XII wasn't really a pope devoted to protecting the Jews, he wasn't a pope really opposed to the Nazis, that he sympathized with the Nazis. I mean, those stories have been circulating for decades now. And they originated with the Soviet bloc? They did. I mean, that, that's, that's a key part of this, but it's a recurring theme throughout the book, Disinformation, is how the Soviets cultivated the, the idea that the Catholic Church was in sympathy with the Nazis. And it began uh, with bishops in, in Poland, Wyszynski, and uh, Stepanak in Croatia, and uh, Menzenti in Hungary, where at first the, the Soviets, they're trying to expand their sphere of influence into these highly Catholic nations. And at first they say, hey, we're just like your local bishop or your cardinals who stood against the Nazis. We did too. Then within a year or two, they're saying, oh, wait, these guys collaborated. They were bad. And you, you, you take a churchman and you associate a churchman with the Nazis. That's about the worst thing you can do. And they had some, some show trials, some fake trials. Uh, lock people up, uh, put them away. Menzenti was lucky in Hungary because there was an uprising in 1956 and the locals liberated him and he made his way to the American embassy. He wrote his memoirs and explained all this stuff. Uh, all this went through and Pius XII was still a hero. Pius XII from the end of the war until the 1960s was the one voice crying out of the silence of a continent according to the, the New York Times. Who, the guy who was pointing his finger right at Hitler and saying, you know, you're doing wrong. Then he dies in 1958, and they essentially take that same model that they used for the bishops and the cardinals uh, in, in the, the Soviet bloc and applied it to him through the context of a fictional play. They, they wrote a play, they developed a play, they promoted the play, they built these stories around, and with no new evidence at all, you go from hero pope to Nazi pope, and it's just incredible. Uh, somebody, I, I forget the person who said it, but something about, uh, it was in your book, something about you can make a saint a sinner. Oh, yeah. You know, and That's the power of disinformation. Power of disinformation. You have people today who, I mean, right now we've got the 50th anniversary of the landing on the moon. People believe hey, it, was all, it was all fake news. They, they don't believe it. Or you've got so many people who don't believe the Holocaust ever existed. You've got... You know, the ovens and so forth that you can still, I think, visit over in Germany. People don't believe it. Um, so, um, but, uh, you know, Pius XII, I think they, didn't they tried to float that story. I think Stalin tried to float that story back around in the 1950s, the early 1950s. Right after the war. Yeah. Right after the war, they floated. The, in fact, used the phrase Hitler's Pope. And it was laughed off. Yeah. Everybody had seen what happened. It, it went nowhere. Right. And they, they put it aside until 20 years later, they bring it back up. And then it works. Now, um, it's, uh, it's interesting because um, all of this talk of, of disinformation, it, it struck me as um, having parallels with what we're experiencing a lot now in our country. You said before, a lot of times you see the news, you can't say, you can't determine what's true, what's not true. Um, we live in a, we seem to live in a culture where the narrative is the important thing. It's all about the narrative, and whatever you know is going to help advance your cause. Say it; it doesn't necessarily matter if it's true or not. And the thing was that this seems to go back to the 1960s and 70s, and there was one man in particular back in that time period who was sort of a champion of this methodology, and his name was Saul Alinsky. And. Uh, um, it was as early as 1970 that Time Magazine actually wrote that he actually forever changed the way politics was going to be practiced in this country. And it just seems like we're seeing that. I mean, people describe our country today as more divided than ever. Gone is, is the time when you could say, well, I disagree with, I disagree with you, but I, your opinion, but I still respect you as a person. It doesn't happen anymore. And... Um, 
you know, that's that's all part of that's all part of a program. People might not realize it, but um, you know, part of what we're trying to uh, draw out with the programs that we're doing on this subject matter is that there was a well orchestrated methodology, much like the methodology practiced in the Soviet bloc. There was a methodology. There was there was a, a very defined set of means to this supposed madness. Mr. Linsky's most famous book, Rules for Radicals, sets out a whole series of these rules that spell out that methodology. And one of his first principles that he had was agitation. You can't affect social change if people are complacent. You have to make people angry. Um, you have to make people feel um, so frustrated, so lost, that they become angry, and then you feed them a channel in which they can uh, vent their frustrations, voila. Um, and then you've got, you've got a movement started. Now, Soviet intelligence agencies, the Soviet black intelligence agencies, they practiced something very similar, did they not? I mean, the, for example, um, I think they tried to incite rebellion in the Latin American countries. Oh, sure. You know, I mean, the liberation theology was... Liberation theology, that, that's one of the more controversial claims that we make in the book, but uh, liberation theology, if not entirely developed within the Kremlin, was certainly promoted, uh, 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 spread, <laughs> encouraged, because it takes religion and turns it into political, a, a, a policy-driven, politically-driven entity. And uh, this, that, that, that served the, the uh, Soviet cause because you agitate people, you get them upset with their existing government, you create doubt and questions about the government, the institutions, the religions. So ultimately they topple those things. And then the Soviet ideal, of course, is that they bring in a communist government to replace it. And you can feed a, feed a lot of that frustration and so forth by spreading rumors and innuendo about the people that are in power that you're trying to replace. So the disinformation, the line goes hand in hand with trying to agitate people. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I think you've talked about seeing it today. Today, if you're trying to bring down the democratic republic we have in the United States, what would you do? Well, you'd make people question the police and question the military and question our history and, and tear down our statues and, and destroy our borders and eliminate you know, our, our common language. <laughs> you do all those things. Those are, things are all under attack today, right? They're all under attack, yeah. Um, now, the, the whole reason for this whole methodology that Mr. Linsky developed was this notion that he, that he talked about of the world as it is, to use his phrase. And the way he saw the world was a world based on conflict. It was all conflict. All human relations, social interaction was based on conflict. As opposed to, um, if you're listening to, uh, you, want, you know, if you're going to listen to Pius XII, for example, um, or anybody else speaking the Christian message, it would be no. The true relations that people have with one another should be one on love, that that's what we're meant for, that's what we're built for, we're designed in the image of God, that's what we're designed to do. The opposite of that, of course, is conflict. Now, Mr. Pachepa, or General <coughs> Pachepa, uh, describes uh, a little bit in your book about what life was like in the Soviet Union. That, um, as I understand it, um, you were always fearful. You always had, they had microphones everywhere. I mean, it just seems like there was this uh, pervasive conflict between the individual and the state. Is that what you understand? No, I think, yeah, I think that's absolutely fair. There, there's the, there was the constant perception that you were being viewed, whether you were or not, you had that fear that you were constantly under surveillance. It, you know, it's one of the things where you're a little bit different with Alinsky and the Soviet Union is that within the Soviet Union, it was... The, the government in power that was doing it. And Alinsky, it was from the outside. But basically, at some point, the outsiders take over. And, and what do they put in place? Well, they put in place, I think, what, what they've used to get power. And you end up with what we had in the Soviet Union. Well, I mean, one of the similarities between Alinsky and um, communist ideology is the lack of a belief in God. Now, Alinsky 
uh, is described by his supporters as basically an, an agnostic, and I think that's probably fair. Um, but God does not play, or belief in God does not play a part in his philosophy about how we should organize social activism and so forth and, and achieve social change. It just was not a part of his thinking. So if you have, um, like in the Soviet bloc, uh, you know, uh, a way of thinking that is based on the state being everything, and then in the Alinsky system, you have, you know, a, a thinking which is based on, well, just achieving social change without God. If you take God, God out of the equation, you create, I mean, what is similar about both is they take God out of the equation, and that then creates a playing field for conflict, where things can be based on conflict, because, you know, the religious factor is, is, is going to be in the background saying, no, you should, you should not lie about other people, you should not spread disinformation, you should actually be kind to one another, kinder to them than you are to yourself, love, peace, etc. Um, but to me, I mean, you were talking about that there's a difference between the two, but there's also a similarity. Oh, yeah. You know. Absolutely. It, and and I mean, we mentioned this a little off camera. I, mean, I, I see Alinsky as there, there's the, the, the approach he takes to things, and there's the, the end he seeks. And if we just focus on the approach, the approach is, is completely devoid of any value, of any morality, really. It, it's It's seizing power any means possible. And I think the Soviets absolutely hung on to power through any means possible and did not have, obviously, I mean, they were anti-Christian. Alinsky, interestingly, locked in, tied in with some Catholic groups um, with some of his work, which is surprising when you go back and you read about it. Uh, but I do I do think there's tremendous similarity that in that in the the way they operated, there was no morality to the obtaining power or using power. I, mean, I understand why the church, uh, some, a lot of people in the church, got connected with Alinsky. He had um, what, what for, for anybody looking at it, seemed to be um, noble goals. He's trying to help the poor and the oppressed get a voice so that they can you know, get, better, get better jobs, get better health care, et cetera, et cetera. He was trying to help the poor. That's an obvious natural fit with the Catholic Church. Um, but uh, as we say, you know, the, his, his idea was one based, was based solely on conflict. Um, and another one of his ideas, oh, actually, one thing I was going to, I was thinking as you were talking is there is a difference between, obviously, the Soviet system and the American system. But if we were to take the Alinsky model and play it forward, one decade, two decades, maybe five decades, would we perhaps get closer to the Soviet model where the state gets more and more power? The Alinsky system is based on groups uh, achieving a certain uh, level of, of, of power through having their, their political voice. And, and there's a great deal, and Alinsky's tactics are used to achieve power. And if you achieve more, and if you obtain more and more power with these Entities that are affiliated with the government. I mean, would we end up? Eventually, would you end up eventually reaching the system that Pachepa fled? I mean, it seems. I mean, there's a logical connection. It would seem. I think it absolutely. You inherently will will end up in that position, because people being people, once they have used deception, you know, whatever it takes to obtain power, they're going to use that same power to control the government. That's precisely what happened in the Soviet Union, and 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 I think in disinformation, yet you read a, a very exciting account of Pachepa's escape, and it's an escape from a government that was prepared to kill him, prepared to kill his daughter, uh, do whatever was necessary to keep people from revealing the truth about what that government stood for. Yeah, and and then of course they tried to prevent him from leaving, but then they also tried to kill him after he left. They you? did. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, now there's another another similarity is um, this idea of slandering an individual person. Now Alinsky talks over and over again about polarizing an issue, that you have to, you can take an issue, but then you have to personalize it. 
it's not enough to talk about it as an abstract concept. You have to identify whatever issue you've got, you identify it with some person on the other side. And then you polarize the issue by slandering that individual. He's, he's a terrible person of one sort or another. And um, I think uh, Pacheco talks about the fact that, if I can find it here, yeah, that uh, one of the, um, I guess, prime uh, efforts of the, uh, one of the rules that they had in the Securitate was to spread derogatory information in such a way that the slander would convince others that the targets were truly evil. I mean, that's sort of a, um, that's a requirement, is it not, in, in this whole system that uh, Pachepa, you know, became so adept in? Well, it, it really is, because ultimately, you know, when I, I give my talks, I talk about the communist system. Ultimately, the communist system, I have to convince you that it's okay to take her property to distribute among us, even if that means that you have to kill her, we have to kill her. I've got to convince you to be able to think of a person as as an evil entity, not even a person. And you know, talking about that, I, I couldn't help but think of the Kavanaugh confirmation hearings. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we just we're going to take a, a person and and make really, in retrospect, outlandish outlandish charges, uh, but you're you're just tearing down a person who you know. Most people aren't going to put themselves through that, uh, but he he yeah. held in there and was confirmed. Yeah. So, because that was all about um, destroying that person, right. and I mean, these were charges of what thirty-five years old, something of that nature. I mean, the kid was supposedly when this happened, he was a junior in high school, seventeen-year-old kid, whatever it was. Um, but that was what the prime. Or the primary issue with his confirmation. You've, it's not his decisions. It's not you know, the opinions that he wrote. Uh, it's not his positions on the Constitution. That's what, it's, it's personalized. Right. The issue is just simply personalized. Um, so um, and any, um, you know, another, another, another thing that, um, uh, that, is, that is a huge topic in all of this is the truth. The truth doesn't really matter so much. And there's a, there was an interesting quote. What was it? I think it was Yuri and Dropoff who likened it to using cocaine. Right. You, you can, if you use it once or twice, uh, you may not become an addict. But when it becomes part of anything you regularly do, you can become addicted. And that's how, how lies are. And that's what happened with the Soviet system. That was part of Pacheco's problem with the system, was when you build a culture, and the culture and the government and everyone is all based on lies. It's really hard to get away from that. Well, we're going to we're going to take a, a break right now. We're going to we're going to pick this back up. But we have uh, we've been uh, talking with uh, Professor Ronald Richlack, uh, professor of law at the University of Mississippi, and he has written a book called Disinformation, and all it's all about how spreading news that was not truthful was basically a way of life in the Soviet bloc countries coming from a man who defected back, was it 1978? Uh, that's right. Uh, defected in 1978. Um, so in any event, this has been very interesting so far, and we've got more in store when you join us again. Thank you. Welcome back. I'm Ray Gerard. We're uh, broadcasting on SJEN TV, and we're back again with Professor Ronald Richlack from the University of Mississippi. We're talking about fake news, Soviet bloc disinformation campaigns, and Saul Alinsky. Quite a lot to put all together, but we're we're giving it a good shot. Um, now, where we left off, we were talking about polarization and the need when you're trying to. Um, either uh, achieve some social activist goal or um, achieve a communist goal uh, of, of disrupting something in, the, in, the Western, in a Western country, um, you need to take an issue and then make a person, some kind of person, a focal point. And then you have to, uh, and by doing that, you personalize the issue, and then you have to tear down that individual. Um, 
Now, this is something they did with, uh, would, you, would you mention before, Cardinal Manzetti? Manzetti? Right, Car Cardinal Manzetti. And Cardinal Manzetti. Stepanak. Stepanak and Wyszynski in Poland. Uh, all, all those folks faced it. But um, in our time, the, 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 the Catholic leader who's taken the greatest heat in terms of, uh, of the Holocaust and the Nazi stuff is Pope Pius XII, uh, who was framed with a fictional play. It, really, it's a brilliant plan. If, if I want to depict you as an evil Nazi sympathizer, um, number one, I wait till you're, de till you're dead. <laughs> and then I don't write a biography or a history. I write a fiction with you as a central character. And, and, and I, like so many other scholars who've studied this and said, well, this is wrong, this is wrong, and this is wrong. The answer is, well, of course, there had to be literary license to, to make some things, but it's fundamentally true. Yeah. But this is wrong and this is wrong, but we know, but it's fundamental. And you can't argue back against that. Dan Brown did the same thing with his novels, um, Angels and Demons and Da Vinci Code, where, where, which are some are very anti-Catholic. And you try to say, you know, these things are wrong. And, yeah, but it's fundamentally right. And, and yeah, Close it, to, yeah. yeah, yeah and, and, and so it's very frustrating. But that's enough. If you put it in a fictional setting, it's enough to cast the aspersions and cast the doubts in people's mind. And especially if you did like the Soviets did, they would have three or four influential writers argue, you know, write pieces reviewing the play or reviewing the book and, and, and saying, you know, this yeah. is very persuasive. So it's not just put the play out there. It's put the play and then put the reviews and promote the play and get it translated and make sure it's produced well and bring in big stars to be part of it. And, uh, and 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 get it done that way. So it's not just it's not a one time shot. It's it's a there's a whole system behind it. Yeah, you had a comprehensive all down the line set of arrangements where you know you, you get it out and then people would would stoke the interest in it. As you say, you get you get sympathetic people to do reviews on it. Yes, and build it up and so forth. Much like we do like. Um, Social media now. I mean, so you got to you got to get followers. You got you got to you know build it yeah, up. Yeah, that's that's right. You can you can get bots or you, you can buy followers and stuff. Yeah, that's yeah, kind of yeah. what they did. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, um, yeah. I mean that that play. I mean it it. it well, the thing that's interesting about that play is, you, I guess didn't they make it a practice to um, inject certain things that were true? Wasn't that like like one of their you know, standard rules that you needed the so-called kernel of truth. A kernel of truth. It, the, the good information is built around a kernel of truth. It, there's a kernel of truth to, to something, and it's not falsifiable. Uh, yeah, sometimes say you, you never use original documents. You make Xerox copies. But, but, it, but you, you have something there that's built around something. They say good humors has an element of truth. Disinformation has an element of truth. Uh, but and it's something you can't. Someone can't point their finger and say clearly this is wrong. Uh, and and you promote that and you let that float and that becomes the narrative. And once it once it's the narrative, it's really hard to overturn. Because once you get that kernel of truth out there, that is something that people can believe. They'll always fall back to that. So if the if you've got them believing something, you know, it's like you get. You have something, an item on sale to get people in the store. It's the same concept. So now you get something out there that they can believe. And if they can believe one thing, well, then the next thing and the third thing that you tell them, you know, they're more prone to, to go along with it. As a matter of fact, they actually referred to it as a, as a science, didn't they? They Absolutely, the science of disinformation. Yeah. And the, the, one of the things that always amazed me is I was working with Pachepa. Pachepa would say, yes, and in our, our they had like an encyclopedia of the work they did in intelligence behind the Soviet bloc. See, in our encyclopedia, we bragged about this thing and that thing. And I'm like, you're kidding me. They, surely an intelligence agency didn't put, but you know, they did. They actually, there was a book like that. And, and he's not, other people have written about these books and, and uh, I've, I've not actually read the Russian book. I can't read Russian if I could, but I've read accounts by other people who have, you know, quoted the same thing Pachepa's referred to. and. And there really was an account where they would brag about this campaign or that campaign or this technique and that technique. I mean, it was a science. Well, why, why wouldn't you brag about it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, <can't. laughs> I mean, if you come up, you're sitting there in some back room and you come up with something, so let's convince the world, let's convince the entire Western world that about this crazy story. And then people buy into it and it works. Why would? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, and, and that's exactly right. That's what they did. They, they, they bragged about it. Um, now, 
It was interesting. He talks a lot about the fact that. Um, you always say he, by the way, and I just want to point out. The, the book is written in first person in his voice. Well, we collaborated, but it is written in Pacheppa's voice. Right. And, um, but he talks a lot about how um, it seems like it was, it was cultural that this, um, this science of disinformation um, was cultural. It was not new to the Soviet Union. It existed in Russia before this. He makes a lot right, of it. Right, right. We, we go back through the history, go back to the Potemkin village idea. Uh, of um, a, a prince uh, seducing um, uh, Catherine, I believe, uh, with Catherine. the I idea of, of being the, a prince of, of a great wealthy village when, in fact, it was a Hollywood set, just had, had fronts <laughs> of buildings. Well, you take that back and you bring it through the, through the Russian era prior to the Soviet era, but then go through the Soviet era. And the thing was, it was often internal. It was early in the Soviet era, it was... It, it, it was, well, the, the beautiful one is Khrushchev. Khrushchev uh, is taking over after Stalin, and he wants to have a new opening to the West. Uh, and he can either, he can go to the Western leaders and say, hey, I'm going to be a new kind of leader. We're going to have a new relationship with the Soviet Union. He, he can try that, uh, but he didn't do that. Instead, he has the secret speech. And the secret speech is he brings the Politburo in, and he says, this is secret. This is among us, comrades. Uh, don't share this. And he said, Stalin was really a pretty bad guy. He did bad things. The yeah. world doesn't know this, but I want you to know I'm going to be different. We're going to be different. The Soviet Union's going to be different. Don't tell anybody this. Keep it secret, just among us. Uh, but but that's, that's how it's going to be. And then he also had some of his agents slip copies of the secret speech <laughs> to the CIA and the Mossad. Yes. And, and those agents came home and said, hey, look what we found. Tremendously more influential, persuasive, believable than if he had just taken the podium and announced to the world that he's going to be a different kind of guy. No, yeah, we, we got it without them knowing it. They, don't want to, they didn't want to let us know that they're going to be a new kind of Soviet Union. Exactly. But we found out on the sly, and it's all just one big disinformation campaign. Exactly. Yeah, wow. Um, they, were, they were pretty good at it. <laughs> um, now... Uh, but the, it was this whole idea of, of the truth, and the truth, um, it's almost like a game. The truth doesn't matter. And this is a, another thing that is um, revealing in regards to the parallel that it establishes with the thinking of Saul Alinsky. And the reason why I keep going back to this is, it's these writings of Saul Alinsky that have been at work and at play here in the United States for decades. People have bought into it. People don't even realize that they're following a script that someone wrote decades before. And he said, um, there is no such thing as truth. The truth is relative. It's fluid. It's changing. And if the truth is relative, fluid, and changing, and there is no objective truth, then there are no morals. Well, there are no ethics. Because, you know, those are also fluid, relative, and changing. And so it opens up the door that you can do whatever it is you want to do. And, but this whole idea, uh, but, but, but Chipa had a very different idea about the truth, didn't he? He talked about, I, m I remember when I read this line in the book, it just struck me because there was such an abrupt change. He said, lying is dangerous because it's the next step towards stealing and killing. Well, it, it is. It is once, and, and particularly when it is not just an individual, but a society, a society that is built on lies, built upon fraud. Ultimately, you have to begin to protect those lies, or, or it'll collapse. But if you don't want to collapse, you protect the lies. How do you protect the lies? Well, with force, intimidation, ultimately with killing if you have to. And, and the... the issue that prompted Pacheppa finally to leave, uh, Pacheppa was a secret Catholic. Um, a secret Catholic. Well, you weren't allowed to be a yeah. Catholic. <laughs> As he said, he uh, uh, got caught, called in once by Ceausescu, asked because he'd been seen in church. And what do you do in church? And he said, well, there was a, a, a concert. He went to hear a concert. And, and so he, he got off the hook that way. But he, he said if he was ever ordered to be part of an assassination, that would be it. And he was ordered to kill the head of Radio Free Europe. 
uh, to if he'd, he'd do it himself or draw up the plans anyway of, of how to do it. Uh, and that's when he decided, he, I can't stay here and be part of this system anymore. And he uh, arranged uh, in, Ger in Germany, he went to the American consulate in Germany and uh, and actually, it's sort of funny. He went to, he he went up to the gate, and there's a marine there, and said, "You know, I'm I'm the head of foreign intelligence for Romania." And sure, I, you are. And, and the guy said, "Get to the end of the line." And he, had to wait <laughs> the end of, and, and he waited several hours. Then he got to the front of the line again and said who he was, and and they, said, and they realized he must be serious. And they took him up to the ambassador, and then the ambassador couldn't even. He had had to call the White House and make sure. Was okay to, to take this, but the whole time, but Champa has got to wait in line, kind of in public, and he's worried he's going to be seen. So it's a really he fascinating story. He actually had to wait. He actually had to wait like a couple hours. Wow, that must have been that must have been scary. Oh, uh, it's fa yeah, and, and and he laughs too when he finally got the approval came from Washington. He was in the men's room, and he said he became an American, uh, waiting in the men's room. <laughs> That's how history is made. <laughs> um, so. Um, Another thing that, that, that strikes me as, as strangely similar is how they justify doing harm to other people. Um, you know, Alinsky wrote that um, a community organizer or social activist is not filled with hatred against those individuals whom he attacks. He hates these individuals not as persons, but as symbols representing ideas or interests which he believes to be inimical, inimical to the welfare of the people. And uh, your book has a quote from somebody, uh, it, was a, it was a periodical, uh, it was right around the time of the uh, Bolshevik Revolution in 1918, and it said, we are not waging war against individuals. We are exterminating the bourgeoisie as a class. During investigation, do not look for evidence that the accused acted in word or deed against Soviet power. The questions you ought to put are, to what class does he belong? What is his education and profession? So again, the idea is, don't th if you, the people that you're attacking, don't think of them as, as, as human, don't think of them as people, but think of them as representative of a symbol, of a class, of an idea, and then, if you don't see them as people, it's easier to justify doing something that's, that's, that's harsh against them. It's almost like we have to become, if we're gonna become less human, if we're gonna act in an inhumane way, if we're gonna commit some act of violence or we're gonna slander somebody, or, but somehow we're gonna do some wrong to somebody else, that sort of dehumanizes us. Again, it's this idea of, you know, well, no, we're built for something different. Our true human identity is for something different. And if we're not following that identity but something else, well, now we're not, we're acting contrary to our nature. So we're becoming less human in our real sense. And if we're going to act that way, we have to see these other people as less human. Isn't that, isn't that the system he's trying to escape? Isn't that a lot of what... I think there is a lot of that, and especially if we think of the soldiers or the agents who have to carry out activities on behalf of a government like that. I mean, the Nazis encountered this with with uh, their normal soldiers being asked to do out, you know, horrible, horrible things that would, uh, you know, if if I'm seeing a human at the other end of my gun, an innocent human, I can't do these things. I have to see it as a not as a person, but as a, a member of a class, or it's an animal, or, or it's, you know, something that, that that's that's a drain on my nation. I have to, it's sometimes dehumanize uh, what I'm doing for for myself. And so, you know, if you're trying to influence me to do something horrible, you got to convince me that it's not as horrible as it really is. Yeah. And you know, it, it, that's there were a lot of soldiers. Um, that's, I know it's a bit of a segue here, but during World War II, there, there, there were Nazi soldiers, German soldiers, I should say, who had horrible conscious you know, crisis uh, issues and, and would come to uh, you, you know, a, a priest to, to confess or whatever. And the priest who might have been in hiding, they have to decide whether to take to receive the, and every story I've ever read, the priest you know would hear the confession, which was in essence saying, "Hey, I'm a priest, and if you're coming to get me, some priest could be captured that way." So, yeah. it's uh, 
and the, 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 the human element in all this stuff on both sides is interesting. Now, to bring it a little bit uh, forward and make it more current um, and put it right here in our country, it's not too long ago. I forget the name of the college, but there was a college. It was only a, a year or two ago. It was up in Vermont. And there was a professor there who um, invited a conservative speaker. And she herself was not conservative. And what she wanted to do was set up sort of a, a confrontation, a bit of a debate to bandy ideas about. It seems like it's the, you know, the classical thing for what should be taking place on college campuses. Right. But what, happened, what ended up happening was a lot of people got so agitated that this conservative speaker was going to be on campus that they, they stormed the event. Um, they actually not only attacked the conservative speaker, but they attacked her wow. as well. A professor at their own college who was not of the, the thinking that they despised. She was of a like mind, pretty much, to these protesters, but they attacked her anyway. And it was about two months after that that she wrote a piece. Uh, I think it was in the New York Times. She wrote an op-ed piece in the New York Times. And what she said was, and, and she suffered. She got, um, I think she had a broken collarbone or concussion. I mean, she suffered injuries. She had to go to the hospital. This was not just a small, right. a small matter. And she said while this was taking place, what she noticed was the people that were there who wanted to hear the event, they were in favor of a free exchange of ideas, could look her in the eye. But the people who were protesting and caused these injuries to both her and the other speaker, um, they didn't look her in the eye. And she said they couldn't do that because then they'd have to recognize me as a human. And it just seems to me that that was what Pachepa was trying to get away from. I mean, it, it was dehumanizing. I mean, they're, they're, people are turned into machines, were they not? I mean, you know, they're living some, you know, they, weren't, they, they couldn't be free. Isn't that what he appreciated about what was different about our country? Well, that's always what he wanted to come to experience from the United States. He, he grew up, his father was a car guy, and America was the epicenter of cars. And so he grew up under, you know, studying America, understanding America, understanding freedom. A brilliant young boy, man, uh, drafted into intelligence uh, in Romania. And then, uh, so when he had the chance, America was where he wanted to come. And he still loves, he loves America very much. In 2016, we wrote an ebook, uh, very concerned about the direction America was heading. Uh, and, and, and he's a guy who, who he was, Pachepa, <laughs> hung out with guys like Khrushchev and Castro and Mao Zedong, and, and uh, he lived at the upper level of the communist sphere. He left that all behind, risking his life to come to the freedom of the United States. And now he's looking at the United States and he's worried about us drifting back towards what he risked everything to escape. I mean, that's what he actually says. He yeah, believes, absolutely. It? it is. I mean, uh, there's, a, there's a, a section in there about the, the 2016 campaign, and I forget what it was, something involving Mitt Romney. And it was all just a piece of, uh, it turned out to be false. It was a, it was a, somebody died, I believe it was, and they accused Romney of, I don't know if, 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 if this man belonged to an alternative lifestyle, perhaps he was, um, but they accused Romney, I guess, of castigating him or making him feel horrible and eventually right. committing suicide on account of it. Right. And I mean, I yeah. tend to remember no, this. Well, that's maybe right. You yeah. Can explain uh, this better no, than well, I can. well, no, I, I, remember, I remember even from the news when that happened. And again, it was people made stuff, essentially concocted a story. Because his sister came out after this. Right. His sister came out and said that was not at all the case. Yeah. That, that, that Mitt Romney did not drive her brother to suicide. Matter of fact, he didn't commit suicide. He didn't commit suicide. <laughs> <laughs> that's a small detail. Yeah. <laughs> you know. uh, but, you know, it didn't matter at the time. If anything we could do to smear Mitt Romney at the time, yeah. that's, what, that's what we're doing. And, and we're seeing that today with all kinds of candidates. And the word that caught me in the book was, as he was, um, as Pacheco was... Um, uh, you know, talking about this event, his the word he used was "wow," as if you know this. If he had done it, this is one of those campaigns they would have bragged about. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, uh, it's, and it is amazing that the number of times, number of times we've seen uh, stories that the news jumps in one direction. He had the the. Catholic schoolboys from Kentucky with the, the Indian protester. Mm. It, the, then, and the news is jumping in with both feet condemning the boys, and boys really didn't do anything wrong there. And 
yeah. we're not too far from Ferguson here, where I think the story unfolded in Ferguson, the officer really was justified in, in the officer's actions there. Um, I hope I can say that here, but I mean, you know, I mean, it, 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 as, as I read the, the accounts, there are a lot of times when the news jumps in, picks picks up a story, and when you follow it through, uh, you know, all the way through, you find out, boy, the news is wrong at first. And the amazing part is that even after some of the details come out that the original impression was wrong, it doesn't matter. That's right. They still, you know, once you're already into the story, you just keep going with it, you know. And uh, that's why it's, it's all about the narrative. It's all about, uh, and this, that was Zelensky's idea, it's about the objective that you're trying to reach. And if you've got an objective and you're trying to reach it, well, it doesn't matter what the truth is. There was a, there was a case, um, he was famous for coming into town and causing a big stir. Did it in Rochester, New York, with Kodak. And when Malinsky came into town, people, everybody braced themselves. You know, something was. Good. And I think this was out in California, but he came into town, and um, they started up some campaign. I don't know if it was against a corporation, and they were targeting the CEO as the as the focal target, the focal figure, or what have you. But whoever was on the other side, um, they were having sort of a, a, a little um, conference. Uh, between Alinsky and the people that he was working with. And some of the people that he was working with said, you know, we're really not so comfortable about saying all this stuff about this this other guy, the CEO. I'll just say he was the CEO. We're not really all that comfortable about that because he's really a pretty good guy. You know, this, this stuff isn't that, it's, it's not painting a truthful picture of the guy. And Alinsky said, he, he talked about these people and said they were political idiots. They're political idiots. It doesn't matter whether it's true. It doesn't matter what you're saying. You slander a guy, you could destroy him, destroy his reputation, destroy his good name, but that doesn't matter if the cause that you're fighting for, as you value it, is a good one. Yeah. You know, I don't think the Soviets lost much sleep over the fact that they were hurting somebody's good name. No, I think you're right. You know, and, and I'll tell you, I've done some debates, for instance, on Pope Pius XII stuff, and people have made arguments that are just flat out false, and there's nothing you can do other than say you're wrong. <laughs> you know, at least when I have a book, when I'm writing, I can take an argument apart, and I can say, here's my evidence, here's my footnotes, look this up, look this up, look this up. If you and I are standing in front of a stage and you say something, I could say, nuh-uh, <laughs> but, but it, it, I would look silly if that's what I said, but you know, I can disagree with you. I can't really... Uh, if, if you're willing to lie for your, your position, it's really hard for me to disprove a lie in the middle of a debate. Well, that takes us back to where we started with this, which is that you know, the first step in the Alinsky method is to agitate. You have to make people feel depressed. You have to make them feel discontent. You have to make them you know, feel horrible in terms of their current situation so that they can vent, they can build up, you can build up anger, you can build up frustrations, and then have them act on it. Well, now you're on an emotional plane. And if you've got anger that's been stoked, um, and then after that anger is all built up, and people are all fired up on an emotional level, and then you say, oh, wait a minute, there's this fact that we need to, you know, recall. Too late. It doesn't matter. Right. You know. Um, and that's, I guess, what um, is disturbing about a lot of what's happening here in the U.S. today. I mean, we, people get so divided. I mean, I think everybody, no matter what side of the political equation you're on, everybody agrees we're divided. Right. Well, yeah, and, and when you have a, a, th that kind of disturbance, when you, you, have, you have an argument and debate and you try to bring it back to the facts, uh, as you said, you miss the moment so often. But... Sometimes you have the one-sided debate where I'm trying to bring forward facts and you're going for emotion, and I've been in debates like that too, and emotion a lot of times wins in that scenario. And emotion is a persuasive factor, and often, you know, I'll take sort of the more conservative side, often won't use emotion, does not use emotion very effectively, at least to understand when it's being used against us. Right, 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 right. Um, I'm going to go back. Um, we began, I think, I quoted Pope Francis. 
So I'm going to go back to that same message that he gave for World Communications Day. And he talked about disinformation and fake news as nothing less than a tragedy. Now, that would seem like, you know, that, that, that would seem like inflated language, like that's overdoing it. But what he was talking about was the fact that um, really what, what comes from lies and untruth and, and destroying people's reputations is that um, you, breed, you breed conflict, you breed anxiety, contempt. You destroy relations between people. And it was interesting because he quoted Dostoevsky. And I always thought there's a little bit of a, of a coincidence. In your book, um, there's that French traveler in the 19th century who commented on the fact that what he found there, we had de Tocqueville come to America in the 19th century and he wrote about what he observed in America. This gentleman went to, uh, went to Russia. He said, they had this culture of falsehoods and lies and so forth. And it was out of that culture, perhaps, that Dostoevsky wrote this because he was perhaps sensitive to it. But he said, people who lie to themselves and listen to their own lie, and I guess that would, you know, if, you know, if a drop-off is correct, you lie all the time and, you know, it becomes a way of life. Right. Um, come to such a pass that they cannot distinguish the truth within themselves or around them. They lose all respect for themselves and for others. And having no respect, they cease to love. That's uh, it's kind of a depressing kind of thought that that's where all this... Uh, Oh, I dropped, <laughs> I dropped my glasses. Um, that's where all this can come to. But that is that is kind of what comes of this, is it not? Well, it, it is. I mean, it's profound and it's sad and it, it defines to a certain extent, I think, Russian literature and <laughs> Russian thought to, to a great idea. It's not bad people. It, it's not the people at all. It's the culture that shapes and, and drives uh, thought in, in a particular direction. And if, if we listen to Paul Francis, what we'll understand, there is a different way. And that different way is one that we've known actually for a couple of millennia. It was the one preached by uh, the most influential person in history. Absolutely. So far they haven't, I guess, uh, come up with a, a campaign that can sufficiently dissuade people that he should be followed. They've tried. But, <laughs> Professor, I want to thank you very much for joining us here today. Thanks, Ray. It's been our pleasure to have you. I've enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>